basically um, what I'm going to be presenting here is in the handout. Um, and the handout is also something that you can take with you because it is a lot of information and um, not all of it will be immediately digestible. So, um, what, I'm just going to wait for these guys to finish. Welcome everybody, first of all. What we're going to be talking about is, and you'll see there are two old school papers on the wall. This one, is, this one relates to the first two parts and that one relates to the third part. The first part is going to be about how presumably most of you started out and some of the qualities that you possessed. The second part is going to be some of the struggles that came out of those parts and it was interesting I I had so many different models in my head um, the last one that I had was of a heart with arteries and veins um, and being as this is the soft side it was pretty appropriate um, and those getting blocked and unblocked um, so stage two is kind of blocked, stage three is kind of unblocked. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through what you have on the, the first page after the cover of your handout. You have this and you have it further fleshed out than what it is there, but not completely fleshed out. So I'm going to go through that. Um, first for the original child, then for the ramifications, and then for the recovery. Um, there are a lot of, this presentation represents a 63 year body of work, um, a chunk of which is mine and a chunk of which I learned about. So it's a synthesis that was done for this, um, for you guys. So we'll see, it's, it's brand new. Consider yourselves guinea pigs. Um, so the first part is a qualitatively diverse process. Wait for these people to get settled, and then we'll begin. So if you turn, if the, the two of you who just came in turn past, if the two of you who just came in turn past the first page to the second page, and look for quality diverse, quality, qu qualitatively diverse process. That's what we're going to be talking about first. Um, people who are extremely intelligent have a qualitatively diverse process from the norm. Most of you people will fall into that category. And what I mean by that is that if you look in the development books, you'll see that children of one, two, three, four, five, six, up to 12 years old, supposedly don't have abstract thought. People of that age supposedly don't have global awareness. People of that age do not combine concepts across disciplines. People of that age are not aware of people other than themselves, supposedly until they're four, five. People who 
are extremely intelligent often are. They're often very, very aware. They're often putting things together that they have no ability to digest emotionally. Um, they're often aware that they are different from the kids around them. They're often aware that they're asking questions of adults that the adults are giving them funny faces um, as they're trying to answer. They're aware of these things. They can be aware of these things at one years old. They can be aware of these things at five years old, six years old, even, you know. So that qualitatively different process um, they're also early to understand issues and be aware of issues of morality and justice. They're often motivated by those issues when they're supposed to be motivated by learning to get good at this and that. Um, deeper, deeper levels of things. They also often make unconscious leaps. Um, and I don't know if any of you have had the experience of being in school in early grades or later grades and being asked to show your work and none of that work was actually consciously in your mind. You know, you went from here to here, um, whether it was in mathematics or your understanding of the world or other people. Um, and um, also lots and lots of questions, early questions, 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 questions. Can anybody relate to any of this thus far? Anybody? Yeah? Um, and also that your experience of things was powerful, that you had at a young age a strong emotional reaction to things. Um, and s especially since many of you are men, that is definitely not the way you were supposed to be. Um, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is how emotions were disconnected um, or perverted, not as in pervert, but as in changed, um, or arrested because they were so unacceptable. Um, let's see, what else? What else did I not cover? Okay, here's, here's a list from um, a man by the name of Ray Swasig who talks about some of these qualities that are qualitatively different from the norm. Um, challenging assumptions, embracing dichotomies, Reconcile opposites, reconcile paradoxes, recognizing patterns, search for systems, seeking change, thinking globally, thinking holistically, thinking pluralistically, thinking simultaneously. Now, if you can imagine a child doing that while they are supposed to be learning what are considered the basics, which are reading, writing, and arithmetic, those are not the basics to this group of people. Those are tools in service to more complex, more integrated, deeper things. Um, Those, okay. Does this resemble any of you? Anybody? Maybe your friend? <laughs> OK, so parents and children. Next topic. Parents and children. Um, Typically, if you have this, your parents have this. Typically, your parents were not given the tools to understand this either or the ability to express it and explore it. So you have that generation. Um, I once did a workshop with, um, I did a workshop about multi-generational 
issues at the Profoundly Gifted Conference. And I asked people who were probably in their 40s then or 50s then, what were their parents like? What were their grandparents like? Typically, the women who possessed this kind of ability in their 20s were institutionalized as insane. I mean, that was very, very common. You know, and you see all these women poets and such who committed suicide. I mean, they came from those, they either were those women or they came from those women. And even though most of you were men, you were raised by women and men. And typically, a lot of times, the women and men find each other and the men have cut off pieces of their emotion to hold on to their intellect. And the women have cut off pieces of their intellect to hold on to their relationality. So now you have a couple who you know, may be of equal ability coping with it in very opposite ways. And they will hold on to each other. That's another thing that's often very typical, no matter how bad it gets, um, if they recognize each other as potentially able to understand, even though they won't. So then you have the child. So let's suppose now that you guys are the child. Um, and so you are the child, and you are coming out with some of these gifts that the parents didn't really have a good way of being able to grow them. So here you come with those gifts that they've either suppressed one side or the other, and those are typically, the, I, they're definitely not universal. So what happens to that child? That child is either the door for the parents, that child is the threat to that parent, um, that child, you know, can be many, many things to that parent. So that, that's complicated too and worth exploring, worth exploring how your parents related to your gifts and also how they steered them. You know, did they see you as, you know, did they see you as your achievements? Did they see you as be careful of your achievements, you know, did they, how did they see you? How did they see you in relation to your gifts? Um, parent, child. Education. Um, how many of you had issues with your educational experience? So, significant number here. There are handouts here if you get to come and get them. We're on page one. Oh. Um, so, education, um, I mean, there are, there are lots of there are lots of extremely intelligent. Oh, there it is. My notes. Um, there are lots of people who could, you know, who could take the education with their abilities and just run with it. Um, and then there are lots of people whose, well, my daughter. My daughter. My daughter helped me get into all of this. Um, she read at 20 months and had issues with global injustice by the age of two, three. Um, and when by the time and by the time she was in third grade, she, they were giving her the timed math tests, and she could do algebra at that point. Um, and she was staring out the window. She had done two problems of the thing. And the teacher said to her, 
Bailey, I know you know this stuff. And what happened? And she looked at the teacher and she goes, I don't know, my mind has a mind of its own. And I mean, that one tends to be one of the bigger problems. It's like, all of you people must have really, really beautiful minds, if you'll excuse my prejudice towards you all. Um, and those minds are powerful. I mean, how many of you have experienced that if you really want to learn about something or if you're really thinking about something, if it's really important to you, that it's powerful? How many of you have experienced that? Yeah. That's not true for everybody. There are some people who are really happy to master and organize the body of knowledge that's taught to them. But there are also people who are very intense and passionate about what they're intense and passionate about. And that, that, creates, that creates a whole ball of wax. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with that one. <laughs> that one's one of those. Um, another thing that often goes along with, with education um, issues is perfectionism. Um, people who, oftentimes people who, whose minds are very powerful can imagine perfectionism. I mean, if you look at some of the people who have really, really excelled in their fields, you know, I mean, you kind of need that, whether you're Baryshnikov or Van Gogh or <coughs> Einstein, I mean, you kind of need that, but it also is a problem because it doesn't exist. So, so the, I, you know, I remember my son at age three, um, he, he was very artistic and he could picture in his mind what he wanted to draw, but he couldn't do it in the first five seconds, you know? So here he has this mental artistic picture that is 20 years old probably, and he has the patience skills and the fine motor skills of a three-year-old. Um, so a lot of that perfectionism can really become an issue and it can get jammed up at an early age in a way that makes people really hard on themselves and also makes them afraid to try because they can't achieve what they can see. Um, let's see, what else do I have here on education? Oh. This one was, this one, I, the person who's taking care of my dog, um, when I said what I was doing, she said that her son says, I am a geek on Monday, I am a nerd on Wednesday, and I am a loser on Friday. Um, and when we talked about it more, it was like, you're a loser on Friday because now it's the weekend. Um, but I think that a lot of people who were very intelligent felt alienation and isolation um, as a result of their differences. And therein goes the empathy. Um, we'll come back to. Oh, here, another one, another one from education is unchallenged. What happens to people if, like, if you're profoundly gifted, five standard deviations from the norm, you learn 16 times faster than the average person, you're sitting in a classroom for the average person, 15 sixteenths of the time, you are dormant. Um, I, had a fr I had a friend who did this whole presentation 
based on a cheetah, which is the fastest running animal. It runs 70 miles an hour. It's designed to run 70 miles an hour in short bursts. And it has the challenge of chasing antelopes. So what happens to a cheetah if it's put in a zoo? Is it still a cheetah if it doesn't get to run 70 miles an hour? But in this case, it's like what happens if you don't get to use what you've got at your speed? How do you adapt? And how do you know what that speed is? So you either do your speed over here and disconnect or you disconnect from yourself to an extent. So under-challenged, I think, is a huge one. And, and then what happens when you get out of school and you wake up and you realize, yes? We might get to this later, but could it also lead to resenting people who hold you back? Yes. Therein goes the empathy, which is what was, yes. Yes. Um, so, intellectual precocity. Well, this is, this is pretty much intellectual precocity. Let's go, oh, yeah. Let's go to asynchrony. Asynchrony, I, I sort of was talking about before um, when I was talking about the three-year-old who can see um, you know, who can see the artist's picture of a 20-year-old but only has the skills of a three-year-old. This asynchrony means uneven development. And I think that the more intelligent you are, the more imbalanced is, you know, the, the greater the disparity of the asynchrony. Um, and it's in all different areas. And one of the problems is with finding peers and friends is that everybody's asynchrony is different. <laughs> so, you know, you might be really brilliant and your friend might be really brilliant, but you might be very brilliant in very different ways. And you might recognize the energy of that, but you might be interested in very different things. The other problem with it is that if you are very brilliant, people expect you to be very mature. And that is not necessarily <laughs> so. Um, or you may be very mature, and that may be the thing that you care about. You may be that person that is looking at what's going on around the room between people instead of paying attention to what the subject is. You know, you may be looking at the dynamics. Even if you're here in the tech field, you know, you may have originally been looking around at the dynamics. You may be looking at the dynamics and be interested in the tech field. You may be interested in the dynamics across the board. Um, so asynchrony plays out a lot. Another way that it plays out is that you have asynchrony with your peers. You feel out of sync with the people around you when you're in school, potentially. You have asynchrony with the society if you care about things. I mean, a lot of the people in this room are in the field of protection, correct? I mean, you know, like how many, how long did you care about protection? Is that old for most of you? Forever. Is that true for most people that that, that was like a focus forever? Because that's a, that's a deep, that's kind of a deep thing. You know, it's like when in school did they get around to talking about protection, you know, and did it come from feeling unsafe yourself? And if so, how? And how amazing is it that if it did, that you took that and did this with it? You know, I think that is, 
I mean, as you know, as somebody from a very different field, I feel very honored to be standing here with all of you people who are trying to protect us. Um, and I think, you know, the whole empathy thing, I mean, it's like, it's a, like, to go from the arc of having felt unsafe to trying to protect what we're doing with the empathy in this particular workshop is kind of the same thing. It's kind of the same idea, is taking wherever you are with it and growing it to a place that's where you want it, to, where you ultimately will want it to be. Um, okay, so sensitivity um, and intensity. Turn to page notion of overexcitabilities. There is this theorist called Dabrowski who has this whole theory of emotional development and moral development. And he starts with this idea that people who are extremely intelligent tend to have what most people in our society would call too much of a good thing. Um, and when I was a child, my adaptation of going through school was, um, and it was my father's as well, you question everything. You question every injustice, you question every limitation, you expand everything, anything, you know, you be that gadfly of society, you be that person that, you know, and it's a, it's kind of an imbalanced stance, and it was definitely a defense mechanism, because when I was little, I was questioning what was there when there was nothing. When I was four, I was running around the neighborhood asking all the parents and all the kids what was there when there was nothing. I was awake for two weeks trying to close my eyes and expand my mind around the concept of space and time to figure out what was there when there was nothing. And I got, as you can well imagine, <laughs> you know, just the major brush off everywhere except at home, which is pretty cool that at least I had that. But by the time I graduated high school, my definition of myself was somebody who had an insatiable need for attention and was very contrary and very aggressive. And then I had my daughter and then got into this stuff, and then I saw this list. And when I saw this list, I cried for a week. Because that whole definition of always feeling like I was too much, it's like, okay, now I'm 36 years old and I'm finding out it was a good thing? This is a good thing? Like, how many people look at this list and relate to any of it? Some, but not all. Yes. Yes. That's the, that is the asynchrony. Everybody, 
who's got it has got it in some areas and not others. Very few people have it in all areas. The areas that you have it in are probably, you know, are the areas of your authentic self, are the areas of your strengths, are the areas to sink your teeth into. Does everybody feel like they have it in some areas? Does it feel, does also, does everybody feel like they haven't always felt good about some of that stuff? I'm not, if I can interrupt. Yes, I'm please. Not, just a question about this yes. idea of giftedness. I can identify with some of the things on here, and mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting and striking to, to think about it, but I would never consider myself gifted. <laughs> of course you wouldn't. <laughs> What do I mean by that? I don't, you know, for me, it's kind of a, it's kind of a superfluous label. I mean, this is, this stuff is kind of, what I'm trying to present is kind of an alternative. Yes, Josh. We anticipated some people might feel that way because we shouldn't assume every single person in Infosec is profoundly gifted and talented. <laughs> I think, what was more striking when we were designing this over a year ago was whether or not that's your cause for some of these things. We share a lot of demographic and personality traits and deficits with empathy. So even if there's any patterns we can take, regardless of if you fit, think this fits you or not, having known several people in this room, we have quite a few profoundly gifted folks that are not diagnosed. Well, there are other elements of this, uh, this list here that I can strongly identify with. Yeah. So I don't know. And I think, you know, I think that whole thing is just, I mean, this is kind of an alternative to that. I mean, I think that that's, it's kind of my, what I do as a therapist, the reason why I went into it was to help people to find their own authentic self. Um, putting a label on it of some sort or not is, in my opinion, really irrelevant. I mean, I think that the biodiversity is obviously necessary for organic anything. So I am not, I, I, I don't really use the, the gifted label. What I use is find out you know what kind of a plant you are find out what kind of an animal you are you know take bits and pieces from everything and you know use what you've got be who you are you know and it's more about for me it's more about that so I I came in through that door but you know, I also have come in through the door of being an artist. I've come in through the door of being a scientist. I've come in through the door of being an educator. You know, and I'm kind of a jackass of all trades, mistress of none. So that's sort of where that comes from. So these, these overexcitabilities are, um, are potential. They're potential. And if any of them are ones that you used to possess that you don't possess anymore, then they're part of maybe what needs to be reconnected. You're almost to the halfway point. There's okay. Time <laughs> really? Wow. I hope this is making sense. I've put together so many disparate pieces to try and paint a picture. Um, so, but that's okay. Um, the next one is society. Um, how do you relate to society? I mean, I think as protectors, you obviously care. Um, and are very, very connected to
to some of the problems that we're having right now in society. Um, I would imagine the, the justice issue is huge for most of you. Do most of you feel pretty strongly about justice? Yeah. yeah. And and that and that must I mean that uh, do you feel like a do you feel like a um, normal member of society? <laughs> right, right. D do you feel, well, let me ask, I mean, I guess I have, quite, I have so many questions. I have more questions that I have things to say. But I guess part of it will be in the, there's an experiential part that um, maybe we'll answer that. Do you feel like there's a place for you in society? Is kind of a. Do you feel like you understand your place in society? Well, I don't know if you're going to get to this, but I think one of the reasons we spend so much time with each other is we're the closest thing we have to a peer group. Mm -hmm. And we also are very nasty to each other. We're competitive, we're destructive, we're cynical, we find out what's wrong with something. So I think it's a combination of both. We spend a lot of time only with each other. <laughs> uh, we have a nice walled garden. Um, is that consistent? Do you have like uh, the negative outcomes of some of these? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it seems to me part of us being nasty to each other, it maybe comes out of that perfectionism. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What about those that need the stimulation, that need for a challenge that you can actually be respectable? <laughs> Sparring partner as a sign of respect. Yes. <laughs> yes. For those of you who were just coming in, there are handouts that will be helpful. Oh, okay. But you are not, right? Um, so, you know, your relationship to society is always interesting. Let's see where I am. Oh, here's another one from society. Um, I would imagine that a lot of you have, and this, and this is something you just brought up from within, but also from without, jealousy. Um, I would imagine that some of you have experienced people being jealous of your abilities and also a fear of people being jealous of your abilities, you know, like a, a need to hide in some ways or a need to come on strong. I mean, I think that's, you know, depending on how people do it. I mean, I think a lot of that sparring is like, okay, it's never felt safe for me to let down my guard and be, you know, the more tender side of who I am. So I'm going to just like take this and shove it down your throat. I mean, I think that was basically my approach, but. <laughs> um, and then expectations. I mean, I would imagine as people who see themselves as protectors, you have very high expectations of yourselves. And that you know, that, 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 that you found that from other people as well. And again, that goes back to that perfectionism. And how can you, I mean, I think that empathy, I think it's very hard to have empathy for other people if you don't have empathy for yourself. And I think that I would imagine that that, is, that also might be hard for some of the people in this room is to have real empathy for themselves. You know, to have that more gentle, not, not gentle as in you get a pass, but gentle as in you're human, you're not flawless. You know, you're 
whatever you do is going to have flaws. It's not going to be where you want it to be. It's not going to be what you see. It's going to be that next step. We were talking about that at lunch. <laughs> yes. The one way that the society thing manifests for me is there's this great quote from, uh, I think it's George Bernard Shaw, who says, the, the reasonable man conforms himself to the world. The unreasonable man expects the world to conform to him. And that's why all progress is dependent on the unreasonable man. Now, I don't know why I always was drawn to be unreasonable, and it may not be the same for all of you, but there's a tremendous amount of inherent, as a package deal, choosing that path to buck a status quo is going to put you at odds with people who like the status quo, or is going to add a dimension to your relationships about they're either helping you or not helping you. And so it's an occupational hazard if that's how you manifest. Uh, but I've always identified with that notion that the status quo is not okay, and if you're trying to aggressively change that, it can alienate relationships or um, come with a whole bunch of other secondary effects. For sure. Um, sense of aloneness. Um, I. I remember being at one conference where there was this guy who was the keynote speaker, his name was Feldman, and he studied prodigies. And he was standing up there, I'm sitting in the audience, he's standing up there and he studied prodigies. He did not identify himself as an extremely intelligent person. He just studied prodigies. And he said, he remembers one night when he was a kid, he was like looking out at the night sky and he was looking out at the stars and he said he imagined himself, you know, as one of those stars and then he imagined himself further out and further out and further out. And then he said, and then I looked back and he said, and I realized that that's the way I feel a lot of the time and then his face went completely blank and his and he he looked absolutely terrified he walked himself into a moment where he felt all alone because he felt so far out there and he didn't mean to go there and I was sitting next to somebody who was a real mentor to me, the cheetah woman, and she and I both started crying. And I didn't, you know, I didn't identify myself as such a person at that point. I identified myself as my, my daughter's mother who was trying to help her. And I'm like, oh shit, excuse my French. <laughs> Oh, no. Um, and I think that a lot of the people who really decide that they are going to hold on to their intellect, and I think that many of the people in this room would probably fall into that category, let go of or let go of, of some of their connection to their emotional self. And they also formed a lot of beliefs because people in, you know, people who can really think as children will come up with reasons for why this is so. You know, it's like, I remember I remember I dropped out of school in first grade um, emotionally. I was sitting at my desk and they had a group of people up in the front who were learning the binary system. And I loved math. I mean, I could, I, I could, do, I could do lots of math at that age and I loved math. I loved the patterns, I loved the numbers, I loved the, you know, like, that it was a language, like it was a language of everything, it was a language under everything. 
and um, and I got C's in math because they just kept giving us addition problems and more addition <laughs> problems and more addition <laughs> problems. And I learned to read and do math with my head on the desk because I was so bored and depressed that I would like to sit there like this. And I raised my hand and I said, can I, can I do that? Can I be part of the advanced math group? This is first grade. And, <laughs> and I said, I know how to do it. I've been watching you. I know how to do what you're doing. And it's really cool. And after that, you can do this. And the, my teacher said to me, you get C's, you sit down. And she said it like right in front of the whole class. And what I did with that was, OK, all of school is never going to work with, for me this problem, this problem is going to dog me for the rest of my life. There's no point in me trying. You know, I made a split session, section, blah, session decision, second decision, and that was that. And um, with this group, those, those things, those split second decisions, and they're different for everybody, are the ones that are related to the loss of connection, the loss of what's called the soft part. You know, the soft, what is it, the soft subjects, the soft? Soft skills. Soft skills, thank you. Those are related to the soft skills for these people. I kept some of my <laughs> soft skills. I kept more of my soft skills than I kept my other ones, but um, but for this room, I think that it's probably pretty much the reverse in a lot of ways. Um, I'm totally going to run out of time. Um, what I think I would like to do is go to. I'm going to go to the page of the questions. And yeah, thank you so much. You're so good. Um, and so what I what I just did is I just combined original child with ramifications in a very slightly underdrawn way. And I apologize for that. I thought I wouldn't have enough material. Um, these questions are questions that pertain to your personal experience of what I just crammed 63 years of knowledge into an hour. <laughs> um, they relate to the personal knowledge, your personal experience of it. Um, and what I wanted to do is have you take notes on these questions for yourself and you you can do it in one of two ways. One way is to actually do your own. The other way is to look at it theoretically. If it feels, A, irrelevant to look at it on your own, um, fine. Do it theoretically. If it feels too much, if it's like too close to home for you to do it on your home, on your own, do it theoretically, do it for some person that fits this profile that I'm talking about. And what I'm going to do after you do it is have people get into groups of five and discuss it. Yes? Um, I didn't get the extra two minutes. I just have one back. Oh. I'm like, where are the questions? <laughs> You're related to it, too, I can see.
does it does this feel useful to look at these questions to people? Do you all have pens if you want to take notes? Does anybody need a pen? You know, when we were prepping from all the things you said, the one that I thought was most digestible to me was you said that we learn empathy as kids by mirroring our peers and being mirrored by our peers. And because we didn't have any real peers, we maybe, maybe never even built those muscles to begin with. Did I hear that wrong? Or that really stuck with me. Yes. Um, Are we going to that oh, okay. in the recovery thing at the end? Okay. But probably even more important to me sooner. There are a lot of things I missed because the time blew by. I think I have another one over here. Here, use one of my uh, <laughs> great paws. Great paws. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> totally. Use your, use your non-dominant <laughs> hand to that'll really do it. Let's see. I have one more pen if anybody else needs one. Anybody else need a pen? Here. Good. 